Give an honor to God, our creator, Jesus Christ, our redeemer, the Holy Spirit who is our sustainer and to all brothers and sisters in Christ who have joined in or tuned in with us on this morning. We greet you here from the St. John Missionary Baptist Church. I do believe there's a word from the Lord on this morning. I hope not to take up too much time, but time is in the hands of God. And so if you have your Bibles, please join me in the Old Testament book of Genesis, the 19th chapter, looking at verses 23 through 29. Genesis is the first book in the Bible. It's right behind the table of contents and right in front of the book of Exodus. I want to take us to a very familiar and an often misunderstood story in the Bible. Genesis chapter 19, verses 23 through 29. I'm reading from the NIV version. It reads like this, by the time Lot reached Zor, the sun had risen over the land. Then the Lord rained down sulfur, burning sulfur, on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. And thus he overthrew those cities and the entire plain, destroying all those living in the city and all the vegetation in the land. But Lot's wife looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and returned to the place where he had stood before the Lord. He looked down towards the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, toward all of the land of the plain, and he saw dense smoke rising from the land, like smoke from a burning furnace. So when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham, and he brought Lot out of the catastrophe that overthrew the cities where Lot had lived. I want to go back to verse 26. It says, but Lot's wife looked back and became a pillar of salt. Amen. This is the word of God for the people of God on this morning. And with your prayers and with your support, amen, with your likes and your shares on Facebook, I want to preach from this thought, trusting God with the next, trusting God with the next. Let the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Oh God, fill us in this place. We thank you for all that you have done. And God, all that you have been in our lives. Thank you. We pray, God, that through this sermon today, you encourage us and help us to know that we must trust you with the next. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, on Friday... On Wednesday, rather, I celebrated my third year wedding anniversary, but on Friday, I celebrated my seven-year anniversary of living in the great city of Boston. Before I moved to Boston, I'd never been here before. I didn't know anyone here. In fact, I didn't even think that black people lived up here, if I want to tell the truth. But I knew that God was calling me to Boston. Because an entire year before, I had this strange feeling on the inside. I couldn't describe it. I couldn't put my finger on it. But something was saying to me, you need to be in Boston. By the grace and mercy of God, I finally came. But before I came, there was so much that I didn't realize I would lose on my way of coming here. There were some friendships I had that I thought I would keep for quite some time, but by me moving this far, it simply ended. 
those friendships. There were some situationships, if some of you know what I'm talking about, that were lingering along Tyson. And by virtue of me moving to Boston, those situationships ended themselves as well. In fact, there were people literally telling me, why in the world would you go so far away to a place you've never been you ain't got no coat, you ain't got no boots, you ain't got no gloves, you don't know nobody there. Why in the world would you go there? And my only response is God is sending me there. Yes, I lost a lot on my way there to here, but I also gained so much during my time here. God has blessed me in more ways than I could ever imagine or ask for in these last seven years. I gained two church families. I gained more friends, good friends. I've made more money, had more friends, more opportunities, seen more things, traveled more things. I've been blessed in ways I can't even describe. But it took for me to step out on faith, stepping over fear, and to trust God with the next because God never told me what was going to happen when I got here. He never told me I was going to get ordained. He never told me I was going to get a church. He never told me I was going to get married. He never told me I would be involved and be a leader in my community and on my streets. He didn't tell me all that. All he said was go. And I went. And I can look back over these last seven years and say, had it not been for the Lord on my side, where would I be? But if we all tell the truth, it's hard moving on from something and trusting God with the next. It's hard moving on from relationships that you've put so much time and energy on to move on to not even knowing what is next. It's hard to move on from one school that you've been in trying to find your next job. It's hard to move on from one nasty church you was a member of, not hoping and believing you would find another church that was better for you. If all of us tell the truth, the truth is it's hard moving on from from something that we've been accustomed to, something we've grown comfortable with, and something we are used to. But the good news is we serve a God who loves us so much that God is always pushing us on to something that's better, pushing us on to something that's greater, pushing us on into our destiny, pushing us on into better opportunities. We serve a God who says, I've got a next for you and the next for you is so much better for you. Turn with me to Genesis 18. For I want to talk about a story that is so ancient, a story that all of us know about, but a story that is often misunderstood in the church today. I want to put this out here, and I want everybody to know, and I'm going to say this flat-footed. I've studied the scriptures. I've studied the text. The story of Sodom and Gomorrah has nothing to do with sexuality. Has nothing to do with it. I know we grew up hearing and saying God destroyed the place because the people were gay. That's not true, and the story never even says that. But God does plan to destroy this city because this city is a wicked, wicked city. The city is so wicked that when strangers show up, people come around to abuse the strangers. If it's a woman, they're gonna gang rape the woman. Excuse my language, I know it's tough, but this is what happened in this city. If children showed up, they would molest and abuse children. And if men showed up, they would do the exact same thing. That's what the story does tell us. The city was so bad, let me try to make it plain, that, that if Donald Trump went there, he would be looked at as an angel. That's how wicked Sodom and Gomorrah is. They abuse people. They hurt people. They economically took advantage of people. They beat up and killed and hurt kids and seniors. It, the city was so wicked that God was ready to destroy it. 
God went to Abraham and said, look, these two cities are so wicked and so evil, I'm going to destroy it. Abraham says, is, is there 50 good people? No, there ain't 50. Is there 40 good people? No, there ain't 40. If they had 40, I'd save it. They go all the way down the line. There's only one family there. And by the way, this family is not perfect, but they got at least some kind of goodness in them. And this family happens to be the family related to Abraham. Is Lot, his wife, and their children. And so by the time we get to chapter 19, at the end of chapter 19, the angels have already came and told Lot, they said, get out ASAP. Don't pack no bags. Don't grab no suitcase. Don't get none of that stuff. I need y'all to get out ASAP. Now Lot is confused. And he's asking, now why in the world do we got to, no, I, I, I done built a house here. I, I got a job here. I, I got money in the bank here. And the angels, the scripture tells us that the angels literally grab Lot's hand. Y'all pay attention to this because I'm going to come back to it. And they carry him and his wife out because they're still asking too many questions. Let me pause right there and say this. When God is in the business and in the plan of moving you and saving you and helping you, you often don't have time to ask a bunch of questions. You got to trust the voice of the Lord and go where he tells you to go. So Lot and his wife, the angels literally grabbed them, tossed them out the city. They start running and running and running for their lives. And as they run, Lot's wife turns around. And the scripture says that she turns into a pillar of salt. This is both the tragedy and the lesson of the text this morning. Because so often Lot's wife has got a bad rap in the church as somebody who didn't have faith, as somebody who wasn't no good, as somebody who wasn't worthy of living. But that's not the lesson of this text. The lesson of this text is this is what happens when we don't want to move on from the same places that God is trying to deliver us from. That we can turn into metaphorical pillars of salt when we don't move forward and trust God with the next. But you got to understand why she would turn around in the first place. You got to remember that Lot's wife had a home in these cities. She had money in the bank in these towns. She went to college there, went to church there, had a garden there, had children there, had went to the hospital there, shopped at the grocery stores there. She also saw the abuse there and the evils there. And it's hard to move on from stuff we become accustomed to. It's hard to move on from stuff we've become comfortable with. Let me try to make it plain. That's why some churches are dying today because we've got so comfortable with our traditions and our practices that we haven't accepted the newness that God was trying to give us. That's why some of us find ourselves trapped in marriages, trapped in relationships, trapped in jobs that we should not be in, but because we've invested so much time and so much energy, it's hard to move on to what is next. Can I make it plain? Now, I don't condone, as the scripture says, divorce or anything like that, but there are some marriages that you just should not be in. If you're getting abused and beat up, God does not want you in that marriage. If you are getting taken advantage of and being cheated on every single day and every single week, God does not want you in that marriage. If that marriage is keeping you from church and keeping you from your calling, that is not a relationship that you should be in. The challenge is some of us have gotten so used to it. You know, me and Jimmy, we've been together 20 years. Me, me and Jimmy, we're high school sweethearts. But Jimmy keep giving you a black eye. Yeah, you know, me and Susie, you know, me and Susie, we, 
We, we, we didn't put so much money into this house. We bought this triple decker in Dorchester. It cost us 1.3, but I, I, you know, she doesn't love me. She ain't helpful, but I didn't put so much money into this house and we didn't got so comfortable together that I can't even move on to be what God wants me to be because I'm trapped in a relationship. God was in the business, watch this church, of destroying the same thing that had Lot and his whole family bound. And that is the city of Sodom and the city of Gomorrah. These two cities were keeping them from their potential. These two cities were keeping them from showing love. These two cities were keeping them from living out their best life. And God says, if you won't leave, then I'm going to destroy it. So sometimes God has to destroy things to set us free. And what we got to do is like Lot and his wife and like the angels told them, we've got to run and run far away and don't ever look back. Lot's wife looked back because she remembered all the stuff she invested in those cities. And it's hard to walk away from anything you've invested so much time in. It's hard to walk away from a job that you spent 21 years at showing up on time and leaving. It's hard walking away from a ministry that you've sacrificed staying up late and night. It's hard to walk away from a dream that you've put so much money into. It's hard walking away from a relationship that you bought a ring or a house for, but it just ain't working. It's hard to move forward, but guess what? God says, if you trust me with the next, I'll make sure that you're taking care of maybe we ought to give God praise for destroying the same things that are holding us back that we didn't even realize were holding us back and so the question is Pastor Gordon how do I move forward how do I let go of some things that I've become used to and accustomed to how God can I move forward when I don't know What's next? When I don't know what's around the corner, number one, the first thing we must do is we must trust God with the next. You've got to trust God with the next. For Lot and his wife to leave a place at the snap of a finger from two random angels that showed up, it doesn't feel right. It doesn't seem logical, but God doesn't operate in our own sense of what's logical and what's right. God operates off of his sovereignty and off of his omniscient power. They didn't know what was ahead. God never tells them in the scripture that if you leave Sodom and Gomorrah, I'm going to have a better city for you. God never tells them that if you leave, I'm going to give you a bunch of gold. But he wants them to know that when you step out in faith, leaving the current situation, I will bless you in your next situation. Now, here's the thing about the next. The next doesn't have to be them living in a bigger house because they could be sent to a smaller house and be blessed more in a smaller situation than in their current situation. Are y'all hearing me today? That God doesn't have to give them something that's bigger in order for them to feel as if God is good. God can give them less and give them more at the same time. But what they have to do is trust God and keep moving and trust God with the next. One thing I learned and I've learned and I'm still learning about God is when God starts moving, God starts moving quick. God moves like the wind, like the scripture calls him the wind, and God can move quick, and blessings can come your way, and if you sit back and ask 118 questions and call up 115 cousins, I promise you the blessing is going to skip you by. But when God moves, you can see God moving, because God will often do things that don't make sense. Two random angels showing up at your door that don't make sense. Two, the angels literally have to grab Lot and his wife and carry them out because they're asking so many questions. And it teaches us that we've got to trust God with the next. Faith 
let me say this because for some reason we always forget this. Faith has nothing to do with having answers. It has everything to do with trusting the omniscience and the sovereignty of God Almighty. Because faith tells us if I just trust God, God himself will make a way. If the same God is calling me out of it, that same God is going to put me somewhere else. If this same God is opening and trying to get me to one place, then I got to trust that God will bless me in the next place. If God is moving me, I got to trust that I will be moved as God wants me to be moved. Knowing that God will make a way out of no way. I'm, I'm, I'm immediately thinking about this story. As I mentioned, I, when I moved here seven years ago, uh, my wife came the year after me. And so I had one responsibility, and that is, I need to find a place for her to stay. So I start going on Craigslist and Zillow and all these websites looking for a place to stay. But, but Tyson, as I'm looking, I'm like, hold on, 2200 for, for a studio? I said, no, nah, she, no, nah, we ain't gonna have her stay in no studio for no 2200. There ain't nothing in there. I'm looking deep at all these places to live, and, and all of them either cost too much or they jacked up or both. So I've been praying over and over again. I said, God, now, now you've already made the way for her to come. You know, she already got a school, everything situated. The only thing she don't have is a place to stay. So now it's literally 10 days before she's supposed to get here. And I called, I'm like, look, I'm, look, I'm sorry. I've been trying. I done been to 150 open houses and they want first, last security, broker, this, that, A, B, C, D, and E. I said, I don't know what to do. So we kept, we prayed about it together. We kept digging. And she said, here's a place over in Brookline. I want you to give it a try. And I said, ah, right, Brookline, they look expensive over there. She's like, no, nah, we, should, we should just try it. And so I went. And so what happens is uh, I got the phone number from the landlord. I called up the landlord. And, and I said, yeah, um, you know, my my, my, my partner, she's coming, and I want to know if I can you know, come by and look at your place. The landlord says, well, uh, I'm not there, but, but two of my tenants are there. And so she said, if you want to go by, I'm going to give you uh, the phone number from one of the tenants, and all you got to do is call her. So she mentioned the name of the tenant. And I said to myself, that name sounds very familiar. Oh, well, I'll go. So I went, I traveled over to Brookline, I knocked on the door, the door opens, and the person who opens the door happens to be the other tenant. And this other tenant happens to be the same woman that I've been working with for the last year. Y'all don't, don't hear me, do you? And so when she sees me, she gives me a hug, and she says, are you trying to move here? I said, no, but you know, my, you know, my Porsche, she's moving up and she needs a place to stay. Well, we had a list of about 100 people who wanted this room. But since I know you, we're going to give it to her because of you. Y'all don't know how to get happy. We had to trust God with the next, not knowing what the next was. But because God was so good, God was working when I didn't even realize God was working in the first place. Is there anybody who can look back over your life and say, when I didn't see him working, God was doing his best work. You got to trust God with the next. And here, the next thing, what God has that is next is better than what we have now. Let me say that again. What God has next is better than what we have now. Remember, as I mentioned, God didn't have to give them something bigger for it to be better. God, when he moves you from one place to the next, that's the better. Okay, you don't hear me. Let me try it this way. I, 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 when I went to college, I, got, I had some sister friends who they were in a relationship with a guy who wasn't no good. And you would ask them, why are they still in it? They said, well, I just don't want to be single. 
I'm here to tell you, if single is your next, it's better to be single and safe than be in a relationship and be abused. It's better to have some, a little place to stay than a big house and being abused and hurt and lied on. I'd rather have a little bit of something that's giving me peace than a lot of something that's giving me hell. Is there anybody who can say, God, whatever's next, I know that it's better for me. Here's what I like about God. God don't need your permission to move on your behalf. If God needed our permission to move on our behalf, we all be living in some hell right now because all of us have stuff we don't want to give up. But in the text, God is ready to move to destroy some stuff that's been holding them back. And God doesn't ask for Lot's permission. God just tells them, get out of here ASAP because I got something better for you up the road. Lot's wife turns around and looks back and turns into a pillar of salt. And that is a metaphor of what happens when we simply just can't move forward. That when we stay in stuff that we shouldn't stay in, we all become a pillar of salt in some way, meaning we just are going to waste away by the winds of life and the winds of time. But God is in the middle of doing something, and God has to give them a next, and the next is better than what they have now. I'm reminded of, of our ancestor, Harriet Tubman, and how she uh, escaped to freedom in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and how she went back to get more slaves. You can know that Harriet Tubman would tell everybody, people say, isn't it dangerous uh, going back and forth and, and you're in Philadelphia, you might be free, but you still can't do everything you want to do. And her response was always, look, I might not have everything I want in freedom, but what I have right now is better than what I used to have. I'd rather be running around with no place to stay than a place to stay in a shack working on some plantation, being abused every single day. We've gotta be just like her, realizing that I don't know what the next is, but I know the next is gonna be better for me. I know the next is gonna be helpful to me. I know the next is gonna open doors for me. I know the next is gonna help me to meet people that are gonna be crucial and critical to me walking in my calling. Is there anybody who can just give God praise and say, God, I don't know what next is, what next look like, what next feel like, but if you can give it to me, can God, I'll take whatever is next. You know, God had to get them out of Sodom and Gomorrah because these wicked cities started rubbing off on Lot and his whole family. Let me prove it to you. I'm going to bring out something that we never talk about in church, but it's right here in the scripture. When the angels show up at Lot's house and they heard there were some angels there, they knocked on the door and said, who are these guests? We want to abuse your guests. And guess what? Lot says to the angels, I got some virgin daughters. Do with them whatever you want to do but leave the angels alone. Now, can't you see how Lot, even his own attitude is changing because the city is rubbing off on him. He's been there so long that now he's starting to act just like the folks of Sodom and Gomorrah. And God says, because I made a covenant with your uncle Abraham, that I would bless his people and his descendants. I see the city and town rubbing off on you. I'm gonna get you out of here ASAP because my promise will never be void. My promise will always see through. In fact, heaven and earth will have to pass away first before my promise has to pass away. See, it starts to rub off on lot and the same thing can happen to us when you're in negative situations and in negative environments, the negativity rubs off on you. 
when you're in a gossiping environment, in a gossiping location, gossiping rubs off on you. When you're in a lying, cheating, stealing, no good location, then lying, cheating, stealing, no good rubs off on you. But I got another story if we just flip that thing 180. If you're in a loving and caring environment, then lovingness and caringness rubs off on you. If you're in a praise and a worship church and in that kind of environment, praise and worship rubs off on you. If you're in a home filled with grace and mercy, grace and mercy will rub off on you if you got a relationship with Jesus then Jesus will rub off on you is there anybody in the house who can say God I want to be in a next where Jesus rubs off on me I want to be in a next where grace and mercy rubs off on me I want to be in a next where praise and worship rubs off on on me. I want to be in a marriage where love and forgiveness rubs off on me. I want to be in a job where respect rubs off on me. Is there anybody in your house, anybody in the church house who can stand on their feet and say, God, I don't know what the next is, but I'm a step into the next I don't know what next is, but I'm a jump into the next. I don't know what next is, but I'm a slide into the next. I don't know what the next is, but I'm a hop into the next because the next is where love is. The next is where joy is. The next where peace is. The next where hope is. <laughs> what a say it. Say yeah. Say yeah. Say yeah. But you gotta learn how to trust God with the next. There's a story of a baby. The baby was blind. <laughs> But the baby was trying to walk. And so the baby would stand up. But because he couldn't see, the baby would sit back down. And then on Tuesday, the baby would do the same thing. The blind baby would stand up. But because the baby couldn't see, the baby would have a seat. Saturday, the baby got up, stood up on his seat. But because he couldn't see, the baby sat down again. But early one Sunday morning, the father got up from the bed, saw his blind baby trying to walk. And so the father spoke to his baby and started talking to the baby. Now the baby didn't understand the words, but he heard the voice. And so what he did is when he heard the voice, he took a step towards the voice. Couldn't see nothing, but the father kept on talking. So the baby took a step next to the voice. The baby was rocking back and forth, but the baby listened to the voice and took a step towards the voice. I don't know who I'm talking to. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what your next is, but take a step towards the father. Take a step towards the son. Take a step towards the Holy Ghost. You might not be able to see, but take a step. You might be lied on, but take a step. You might be confused, but take a step. You might be broke, but take a step. You might be hurt, but take a step. You might be single, but take a step. You might lose friends, but take a step. You might lose a ministry, but take a step. Take a step. Take a step. Take a step. Can I 
tell you one more story. This story is found in the Bible. About 2,000 years ago, early one Sunday morning, the tomb opened wide open, and inside was our Savior. But can I tell you what Jesus did? Jesus took a step out on the land, took a step, a step, and another step to remind all of us that you might not know what the next is, but take a step in faith. Take a step in hope. Take a step in joy. Somebody say step, 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 step. Say yeah! Brothers and sisters, we got to trust God with the next. I don't know what the next four months of this year will look like, but I've learned to just trust God with the next. We may not open up or even open up in the way we want to, but I'm going to trust God with the next. Ministry may have to take on new and different forms, but I want you to be just like me. Trust God with the next. Somebody might be trying to figure out right now, what am I gonna do this week with my relationship, my job, whatever it is I'm stuck in. Trust God with the next. We open up our doors of the church at this time. There may be someone in need of giving their life over to Jesus Christ. There may be even someone in need of prayer. We open up the doors of the church at this time. Is anyone standing in the need of either of those things?